Hello, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Dave Chance, and I'll be your host. Uh, today, we're going to be giving an introduction to the opioid epidemic and some of the federal efforts aimed at curbing the crisis. Our presenters are Joel Dubinitz, uh, Daniel Schwartz, and Jesse White, and they're all federal staff at the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, or ASB, at the Department of Health and Human Services, who work on issues related to substance abuse and have been involved in federal efforts related to the opioid epidemic. So uh, thanks to the three of you for being here today. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Good afternoon. Uh, I also want to thank ASPE for their support of this webinar series. And a note about the material today, all the information we'll be hearing about is currently publicly available, and ASPE is not presenting any new findings or activities in this webinar. So with that, Joel, Daniel, and Jesse, thanks again for being here, and I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so this is Jesse White, and I'll be spending the next few minutes providing um, what's a broad overview of opioids, what they are, um, how they affect the brain, as well as a brief summary of the epidemiology of the crisis. So I just wanted to start out with some uh, level setting. So what is an opioid? Um, opioids are uh, a, a drug class that includes both legal prescription pain medications, as well as illegal drugs, including heroin and illicitly manufactured fentanyl and its analogs. All opioids are chemically related, and they interact with opioid receptors on nerve cells in the body and the brain. And it is that um, these interactions that block pain signals and produce the euphoric effects that reduce uh, that release dopamine um, throughout the body. And this is the release that can often strongly reinforce the act of taking the drug, making um, opioids, um, uh, making the user want to repeat the experience of, of using opioids. So um, taking a look at um, the opioid um, epidemic uh, by the numbers, in 2017, there were 47,600 opioid overdose deaths. Uh, and if we look at the most current uh, provisional overdose data from CDC for the 12-month period of January um, 2018 and uh, January 2019, there have been 46,714 opioid overdose deaths. So we have seen um, around a 3.4% de decline in fatal overdoses over this time period. Um, however, I will point out that these are provisional data, and we don't have the final uh, 2018 mortality data um, until um, the end of this calendar year. And just a week ago, um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration released its 2018 data for the National Survey on uh, Drug Use and Health. Um, and that's an annual survey of the U.S. population, ages 12 and older, um, which is our major source of statistical information on the use of illicit drugs, um, uh, tobacco, and alcohol, as well as mental health issues. And in that most recent data release, we find that 10.3 million people reported misusing opioids, and 2 million people reported having an opioid use disorder. So here we have a figure that illustrates how the opioid crisis can be outlined in three distinct waves. Some of you may have um, seen this um, in previous um, opioid presentations, but I think this captures how we've seen the evolution of the epidemic very well. Um, so we have the first wave, um, which uh, began with increased prescribing of opioids in the 1990s, um, with overdose deaths involving prescription opioids, including natural and semi-synthetic opioids and methadone, um, increasing since at least uh, 1999. Uh, the second wave began in 2010, and that was um, uh, with the rapid increase uh, in overdose deaths involving heroin. And then the third wave began in 2013, and that's where we see significant increases in overdose deaths involving synthetic opioids. And in particular, we're talking about um, those involving illicitly manufactured fentanyl, also known as IMF. Um, the IMF market continues to change, um, and IMF can be found in combination with heroin, counterfeit pills, and cocaine. Um, and although not captured on this uh, slide in particular, I do want to note that the department is also closely monitoring uh, the resurgence of additional substances, uh, particularly methamphetamine, as a growing cause of drug-related overdose deaths. And I also want to point out sort of what underlies the sharp increase of overdose deaths over this sort of time continuum is the lack of health system and provider capacity to identify, engage, um, and provide high-quality evidence-based um, opioid use disorder treatment, 
which um, we will address later on in the presentation. So what are we talking about when we say opioid overdose? Um, we're talking um, about um, how opioids affect the part of the brain that regulates breathing, and high doses of opioids are what can lead to the slowing or stopping of breathing and sometimes even death. Signs of an overdose include slow, shallow breathing, small pupils, unresponsiveness, or pale or blue skin from poor circulation. Some of the risk factors for an opioid overdose, aside from high doses of prescription opioids, uh, include taking more opioids than prescribed, combining opioids with alcohol, as well as combining opioids with other drugs, uh, such as benzodiazepines, which um, is a drug class that includes familiar drugs such as Xanax and Valium. So how do we treat overdoses? Um, many folks on the phone may be aware of a drug known as naloxone. Uh, naloxone is the opioid antagonist that temporarily reverses the effects of an overdose. This is the um, you know, life-saving drug, if you will, familiar to, um, to many of you. And there are three FDA-approved formulations of naloxone. Um, we have an injectable vial, um, so think needle and syringe. Um, an auto-injector, think EpiPen, um, and intranasal, an intranasal formulation. So naloxone is a prescription drug. Um, you can buy naloxone in many pharmacies, and in some cases you can buy it um, without bringing in a prescription from a physician. In most states, people who are or who know someone at risk for an opioid overdose can actually walk into a pharmacy and receive naloxone by a standing order so without a patient-specific prescription. This is very similar to in the same way as if you were to walk into a pharmacy and, um, and uh, request a flu shot. In addition, there are many community-based programs that uh, distribute naloxone kits um, and provide training on naloxone administration. So I'm going to stop here, and um, we're now going to get into the treatment side of the issue, and so I'll turn the floor over to my colleague, Joel Dubinitz. Hey, thank you, Jesse. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joel Dubinitz, and as she, she mentioned, I'm going to cover the section on treatment for our opioid use disorder, often referred to as OUD. So in keeping with the Opioids 101 theme, I'm, I'm going to hit just the basics and give you an idea of how we can intervene when someone becomes addicted to an opioid. Addicted in the sense that a person has moved from use to misuse, what the clinicians amongst us refer to in our jargon is disorder. A person's use of opioids has become serious enough to result in a clinically and functionally significant impairment, such as health problems, disability, and failure to meet um, major responsibilities at work, school, or home. They've lost control of their opioid use and engage in risky use, placing them at greater risk for overdose. They experience tolerance, requiring higher and higher doses to get the same effects that used to come at lower doses, and, and they experience signs of withdrawal upon lowering the dose or at discontinuation. The good news is that while an addiction to an opioid is highly disruptive to someone's life, we have effective treatments uh, that can immediately remove someone from harm's way. So medication-assisted treatment is, uh, one of, is the use of one of three FDA-approved medications to first address the neurobiological elements of addiction and also to address all the other problems that accompany it by adding selective and tailored use of psychosocial supports, um, what we refer to as a whole person approach. So while the medication part of the intervention is fairly straightforward, there are many different approaches to building support via the psychosocial component and little consensus in terms of what constitutes the optimal level or type of support. However, few would argue with the idea that the psycho uh, psychosocial elements should target specific problems that accompany each person's needs. An example might be targeting someone's motivation to stay in treatment with motivational interviewing, building a specific relapse, uh, relapse prevention skills, or treating co-occurring mental health disorders such as depression. Though we typically think of the combination of medication and psychosocial interventions as such as individual counseling, group therapy, as constituting the whole person approach to MET, I would offer uh, that many of the psychosocial supports that are part of the human services can also be thought of 
in the context of medication-assisted treatment as crucial components to help someone fully recover from OUD or other substance use disorders. So the core component of MAD is the medication. There are three FDA-approved medications that come in various formulations that can be administered from daily to implement, implants that can last up to six months. The agonist medications, methadone and buprenorphine, address the physiological elements of the addiction and prevent so someone from entering into painful physical and psychological withdrawal. They help manage the extreme negative affect and the physical sickness that sets in as the opioids metabolize out of one system. The treatment drug frees a person from much of the distress that accompanies the OUD and reduces drug -seeking the drug-seeking behaviors that are the hallmark of the destructive side of addiction. In short, whether not without side effects, the agonists will uh, allow one to resume normal social functioning not having to ride out highs and lows associated with active opioid addiction. Methadone is the oldest and most well-known of the MAT drugs, and it can only be dispensed in SAMHSA-certified outpatient um, opioid treatment programs, or OTPs, who dispense methadone for daily administration either on-site or for stable patients at home, um, it, it, or to take home for that, um, to take home. It's a full agonist that completely occupies the mu opioid receptor, uh, which pre prevents withdrawal and minimizes craving. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist, meaning that it occupies less of the mu receptor and achieves, achieves similar clinical effects as methadone, but with a better safety profile. It has a ceiling effect and its negative effects such as risk for respiratory depression plateau even with increasing dose. Buprenorphine is also more widely available. It comes in a daily oral version and now has a formulation that allows for long-acting doses via injection or implant. Physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants with federal, a federal waiver can prescribe it from the community-based places of practice. So prescribers must complete special training to qualify for the data 2000 waiver to prescribe buprenorphine, but any pharmacy can fill the prescription. OTPs can dispense buprenorphine within the rules that regulate these facilities. Now Trexone is the third MAT pharmacotherapy. It's a bit different because it's not an opioid or a controlled substance, but an antagonist that achieves its uh, action through covering rather than activating the mu receptor. It blocks the euphoric uh, effects of the opioids while taking using the therapy, and it does not produce any euphoric effects and reduces craving, but um, a person must have fully discontinued opioids for seven to 10 days prior uh, to starting naltrexone, or they will immediately enter withdrawal when it's administered. It's available via monthly injection, by any individual who's licensed prescribed medications. And while there's potential for the agonist medications to be diverted and abused, there's no such abuse potential with naltrexone. sense of uh, what kinds of settings provide the MAT treatments and how the psychosocial elements of treatment take shape, I wanted to include a slide from a study that we did at the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, or ASPE, where we, we all work at HHS. Uh, there's a link to the full study on the slide if you're interested in reading more. Um, the focus of the study conducted on our behalf by Westat was to better understand what the evidence behind the psychosocial elements of MAT were, what specific supports are being used in practice, and how to best structure them. So the available literature on the value of psychosupports in MAT is limited. Research findings are mixed, though recent systematic reviews have been supportive of the value of psychosocial support. In general, the literature is inadequate to draw conclusions about the types or levels of psychosocial services that should be provided or how to adapt psychosocial supports across settings or patient groups. Yet the professionals in the field uh, who we interviewed, including professional organizations, key informants, um, and the staff and the visited sites all strongly agreed that there's great value in the psychosocial support. Uh, we conducted site visits to the five provider organizations listed on the slide that represented new and old programs, 
that varied significantly in terms of size. And the findings demonstrate uh, great, great diversity in approaches to delivering psychosocial supports. Programs employed a range of supports that vary in content and intensity, including uh, individual counseling, group counseling, self-help groups, case management, peer recovery specialists, uh, medication management, and skills uh, learning groups. Um, some programs offered supports that were very structured and standardized. Others were more patient-centered and tailored their treatment approach or allowed patients to choose their services and providers. Some programs incorporated specialty tracks for patient subgroups, uh, such as pregnant and postpartum women, transition age youth, um, patients with PTSD, and patients with more complex psychiatric disorders. Um, so the lack of com comparable outcomes data and small sample size prevents uh, general, generalizing our findings too far from these case studies, but they do illustrate a broad range of approaches um, to the psychosocial support in that. So um, overall, MAD has, a, has strong support from the research literature. Some of, some of the strongest systematic reviews have found that MAT decreases opioid use, um, opioid-related re overdose deaths, um, criminal activity, infectious disease transmission such as HIV and hepatitis C, whereas um, it increases uh, folks' social functioning and, and it also in, increases retention and treatment. So uh, the second bullet indicates um, that, that using detox alone um, um, is not thought to be effective and, in fact, results in really high um, uh, relapse rates very, very soon thereafter. Um, so that's also an important point to make. So we know MAT works, and if deployed widely, it could launch in, uh, many into recovery and drastically reduce risk for overdose. But there simply aren't enough MAT providers. Um, on this slide, we focus on the available, availability of buprenorphine. So while we know we've made some improvements in the past few years, with, uh, which we'll show you later in the presentation, data from early, the earlier to midpoints of the decade indicate that only 2.2% uh, of U.S. physicians had the necessary waiver to prescribe buprenorphine. Um, about uh, 30 million people lived in counties where they did not have access to buprenorphine treatment. So if they uh, had thought it, it would have been hard to come by. If you looked at data waiver providers by state, the lack of service would be just as stark, um, or was just as stark. The average state had 9.2 waiver physicians per 100,000 compared to 206 per 100,000 physicians who couldn't prescribe buprenorphine. So the ideal situation is that when a person's ready for change and is ready to get help, they can walk into a provider across the U.S. and get started that day uh, with a MAT drug of their choice and have access to the psychosocial support, support that's right for them. However, we still have a long way to go um, to get to that point. So I mentioned that, at, that in ASPE study on psychosocial services earlier, we found specialized programs for pregnant and postpartum women, in, in, which is a population that many have been concerned about because of prenatal exposure to opioids. So we can see from the slide that there are increasing numbers of babies born with neonatal abstinence syndrome, a withdrawal syndrome followed, a following exposure to drugs while in the mother's womb. Uh, NAS, also known as neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, uh, it's expected and it's treatable following repeated uh, substance exposure, exposure in utero, substance ex exposure to opioids, that is. And um, it, it may have long-term consequences for the infant. So some forms of matter recommended for the treatment of pregnant women, long-term methadone maintenance, maintenance treatment has demonstrated improved outcomes for pregnant women with opioid use disorders. Buprenorphine is associated with improved outcomes compared to placebo for pregnant women with opioid use disorders. And the safety of naltrexone for preg pregnant women hasn't been established. All right, so at this point, um, we are going to turn it over to Daniel, and he's going to cover some of the major legislation. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Schwartz, and I'm going to start by talking to you about what Congress has been doing to address the opioid crisis. Over the past few years, Congress has been very active in passing legislation to fortify the national response to the epidemic. This slide highlights three major pieces of legislation with a few notable provisions. The Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act of 2016, or CARA, extended buprenorphine prescribing authority to nurse practitioners and physician assistants, which massively expanded the workforce that can treat individuals with opioid use disorder. The 21st Century Cures Act authorized nearly $1 billion for grants to support state and tribal communities in addressing the opioid crisis. These grants are known as the State Targeted Response Grants, and they have enabled states to do things such as distribute naloxone to first responders and create programs that induct people on medication-assisted treatment within emergency departments after they experience an overdose. And finally, the Support for Patients and Communities Act, passed last fall, created the Interdepartmental Substance Use Disorders Coordinating Committee to strengthen coordination across the federal government for a unified response. It also expanded Medicaid coverage for patients who receive inpatient substance use disorder treatment and further extended buprenorphine prescribing authority to all advanced practice registered nurses. All of these policies have been instrumental in our response to the opioid crisis. Now, let me talk more about what HHS has been doing to address the epidemic. HHS's efforts are directed by our five-point opioid strategy that was launched in 2017. It guides our efforts through five key goals. One, improve access to prevention, treatment, and recovery support services to prevent the health, social, and economic consequences associated with opioid misuse and addiction, and to enable individuals to achieve long-term recovery. Two, strengthen public health data reporting and collection to improve the timeliness and specificity of data, and to inform a real-time public health response as the epidemic evolves. Three, advance the practice of pain management to enable access to high-quality, evidence-based pain care that reduces the burden of pain for individuals, families, and society while also reducing the inappropriate use of opioids and opioid-related harms. Four, target the availability and distribution of overdose-reversing medications to ensure the broad provision of these drugs to people likely to experience or respond to an overdose with a particular focus on targeting high-risk populations. And five, support cutting-edge research that advances our understanding of pain, overdose, and addiction, leads to the development of new treatments, and identifies effective public health interventions to reduce opioid-related health harms. Now I'm going to talk about what HHS has been doing to fulfill our commitment to each of these goals. Here are four examples of our efforts. Last year, the Surgeon General released a public health advisory to urge more Americans to carry naloxone. In his advisory, he highlighted four key populations that are at increased risk for overdose. Those who are misusing opioids, have an opioid use disorder, have recently experienced an opioid overdose, or are being released from incarceration with a history of opioid misuse. He also noted the elevated risk of overdose for patients taking opioids as prescribed for long-term management of chronic pain, especially those with higher doses or those taking their prescription with alcohol or other sedating medications such as benzodiazepines. He strongly encouraged individuals at higher risk, their family and friends, healthcare practitioners, and community members to carry naloxone and learn how to administer it. While we have many evidence-based approaches to prevent and treat opioid use disorder and overdose, there are some areas that require more research. To address these gaps, NIH launched the Helping to End Addiction Long-Term Initiative, also known as the HEAL Initiative. HEAL is a trans-agency effort to provide scientific solutions to the area's greatest need and opportunity across the eight domains listed on the slide. NIH identified 26 research priorities, including novel medications, immunotherapies, and devices to treat withdrawal, craving, progression, and relapse, cognitive development of infants exposed to opioids, and translating discoveries into effective devices for pain treatment. As part of this initiative, NIH also launched the Healing Community Study earlier this year, which will test the impact of an integrated set of evidence-based interventions across healthcare, behavioral health, criminal justice, and other settings. 
The study aims to reduce opioid-related deaths by 40% in three years in highly affected communities across four states, Kentucky, Massachusetts, New York, and Ohio. Last year, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation announced the Maternal Opioid Misuse, or MOM, model, which addresses the need to better align and coordinate care of pregnant and postpartum women with opioid use disorder in Medicaid. The MOM model has the potential to improve the quality of care and reduce expenditures for mothers and infants by supporting the coordination of clinical care and the integration of other services critical for health, well-being, and recovery. States who participate will receive enhanced funds to develop and implement integrated physical and behavioral health care systems and are required to incorporate five key wraparound services, comprehensive care management, care coordination, health promotion, individual and family supports, and referral to family and social services. Each year, as Jesse previously mentioned, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration releases results from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, or NISDA, which is the primary source of epidemiological data on substance use and mental health in the United States. It covers a wide range of substance use topics, including past year use by drug, initiation, perceived risk, co-occurring substance use disorder and mental illness, and need for and receipt of treatment. The results from NISDA are used to inform policymaking by illuminating the areas of greatest need across the nation and in each state. The 2018 results were just released a few weeks ago, so be sure to check them out. And now I will hand it back over to Jesse to speak more about our work at HHS. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so I wanted to take just a brief minute to give a little bit of a broad overview around uh, HHS funding related to opioids. Hopefully, many of you are aware that there has been considerable uh, investments made across the federal government in addressing the opioid crisis. And this slide in particular includes uh, a sampling of some of the major uh, grant investments the Department of Health and Human Services has made over the last few years to support the implementation of the five-point strategy that um, Daniel outlined a few moments ago. So um, within this list are grants that increase access to MAT, uh, reduce unmet treatment need, reduce opioid overdose-related deaths through the provision of prevention, treatment, and recovery activities for opioid use disorder, uh, as well as grants to improve our ability to obtain um, the high-quality, comprehensive, and uh, timely data on overdose morbidity and mortality, um, which are imperative to our ability to inform uh, prevention and response efforts. So tracking our progress is key as the epidemic continues to evolve um, and how we consider how to most appropriately and effectively target our efforts and resources. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we have seen what is really a sort of three-part wave of the opioid crisis. And um, as we've shifted from prescription opioids to heroin to fentanyl as being sort of the major drivers of drug, drug overdose deaths, our response has um, certainly um, uh, been responsive to, to those shifts over uh, the last couple of decades. So one of the ways in which um, here at the department we have been tracking um, our progress around key indicators is through our reporting on the department's opioid um, agency priority goal. So the, H the APG, as we know it, um, is a mechanism for us to set outcomes and measure results um, and bring focus to mission areas where HHS agencies need to drive significant, significant progress and change um, as, as it pertains to the opioid crisis. We publish our progress on these APGs on a quarterly basis on performance.gov, so um, everyone on this webinar um, can have access to, um, to the quarterly reports that are posted, um, and you can see the various key indicators um, and the progress we've made um, over um, um, over um, the last um, what looks like two two years. So our APG on opioids is focused on reducing opioid prescribing, increasing access to naloxone, and increasing the uptake of medication assisted treatment. Um, and on the next slide, I'll uh, walk through some of the progress we've made on several measures through um, quarter two of of this most um, of the current fiscal year 2019. 
Thanks. So starting from um, the baseline of September 30th, 2017, and our tracking will continue on through um, the end of this month, um, 2019, um, we look at a variety of key indicators, um, uh, looking at opioid prescribing, um, expanding access to naloxone, and increasing the uptake of MAT. Um, while they're not um, on this slide here, they're, they're available on performance.gov, I thought it would be helpful just to sort of lay out for everyone what our sort of targets um, are for the APGs, and I think that will help put into better context what the um, results um, are uh, uh, here on, on the slide um, titled Key Indicators, FY19, Quarter 2. So in terms of our goal, um, our, our agency priority goal, um, around uh, reducing opioid prescribing. We have a goal of decreasing by 25% the um, morphine milligram equivalent of opioid analgesics dispensed in the U.S. Um, we have a goal of decreasing by 10% the morphine milligram equivalent in opioid analgesic prescriptions dispensed in, in the U.S. Um, we have a goal of increasing by 30% the number of prescriptions dispensed for naloxone um, in U.S. outpatient retail pharmacies. Um, we also are aiming to increase by 25% the number of unique uh, patients receiving prescriptions for buprenorphine. We hope to increase by 100% the number of prescriptions for long-acting injectable or implantable buprenorphine. And we also have a goal of increasing by 25% the number of prescriptions for extended-release naltrexone. So here um, on this slide, I've pulled the most recent quarterly data um, from um, the Q2 APG report. Um, and in the left-hand column, you will see this, several of the key indicators I outlined. Um, and you can see that based on our sort of baseline of um, September 2017, um, we have made considerable progress in achieving our goals. Everything that's sort of highlighted in, in green here, um, you will see that we have exceeded our, um, our current target values for quarter two and um, we are encouraged by trends we continue to observe in the data that we track and hope to continue to see more, um, more green boxes as we continue reporting on the opioid APG. Next slide. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we are encouraged by the provisional drug overdose data, um, which have shown a declining trend in overdose deaths, as I mentioned. Um, we've seen a 3.4% decrease, um, which corresponds to the 12-month interval beginning um, in January to, uh, 2018 and ending in January 2019. Um, and this is really great considering that we do have um, a goal here internal to HHS to reduce drug overdose mortality by at least 15% uh, by January 2021. So um, we recognize that um, what seems to be the declining trend um, in drug overdose deaths is, is very encouraging. We recognize that we certainly uh, have a long, long way to go um, in really um, curbing um, the opioid crisis. And now I'm going to turn things back uh, to Joel, who is going to talk a little bit more about um, treatment for OUD and I think is going to wrap up um, the presentation before we get into questions. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so, uh, you know, while we, we, we certainly need uh, to get more folks um, connected with medication-assisted treatment, the, the people who need it, um, we're making progress. Um, so if you look at the left side of the slide, you can see that in recent years we're treating more and more people, um, mostly with um, buprenorphine and methadone. Um, and on the right side of the slide, um, if, you, if you just mix together everyone who's getting um, some type of MAT, um, we are also seeing progress over the years of 2016, 17, and 18. Um, so despite some of the, the, the numbers I, I gave you from the literature earlier um, about MAP providers, we, we are providing more medication-assisted treatment, and um, we're happy to see that the trend is heading in this direction. Um, so just in conclusion, um, you know, we're really excited to get this opportunity to talk to, to you all. Um, and um, we wanted to keep it fairly, um, fairly straightforward um, because there's a lot you can dig in, and um, we know that we will be digging in um, in greater depth in the human services um, sections in, um, 
in, at the up upcoming forum. So we, uh, we wanted to just call attention to a couple of resources. We don't have the, the links on the slides, but the two that, um, there are two, one's kind of an aggregator. Um, a lot of the things that you, the, the data and material that we pulled from today is available at hhs.opioids.gov. All right, sorry, Jesse. Oh, say sorry, it. it's um, www.hhs.gov slash opioids. All right, so that's good <laughs> that she corrected me. Um, so definitely make use of that resource, not the first resource. Um, and then also I think a really nice, concise walkthrough of almost everything we presented today um, is in a, the Surgeon General Spotlight on Opioids. That's available at the web, that website we, link we just gave you. Um, but it's called, uh, sorry, the, it's called Facing Addiction in America, the Surgeon General Spotlight on Opioids. Um, most everything you need is in about 31 pages, 35 pages, and there's also a, a great list of key federal resources at the end of that report. So, um, and then I just chime in, one, another resource I think that can further elaborate upon um, the five-point strategy that Daniel outlined um, sort of midway through our presentation. There's a really nice document that I think further operationalizes the ways in which the department is um, implementing the five-point strategy and, and various objectives that would fall within the five priority areas that he outlined as well. And, and that, too, is available um, on our HHS resource page uh, on opioids, um, hhs.gov uh, hhs slash opioids. 